Let's give it up one more time for Amy Goodman. MashaAllah. So I'm so um, honored and humbled to be here um, just as I was last year. And I think um, I always wonder why Ikna invites me, but I guess maybe Ikna does like that I come to these stages to speak the truth and nothing but the truth. Sometimes the truth, sisters and brothers, is a little bit uncomfortable. So you're going to have to allow me as a member of your family to speak some uncom uncomfortable truths. We appreciate you. Not everybody in the Muslim community loves me. That's okay. So this particular section for me was entitled, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. That was actually said by a woman named Shirley Chisholm. She's the first black woman congresswoman and the first woman to receive a major party nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. So there would have never been a Hillary Clinton without a Shirley Chisholm. You know, Shirley Chisholm was what they called unbought and unsold. She was principled, and she stood up for what she believed in. One time she said, I want history to remember me not as the first black woman to have made a bid for the presidency of the United States, but as a black woman who lived in the 20th century and who dared to be herself. I want to be remembered as a catalyst for change in America. Sisters and brothers, it is in the spirit of this beautiful, strong, and bold black woman in America that I stand before you in 2018 trying my best to live out who I am and who I am proud to be and be a catalyst for change in this United States of America. That requires a lot of work and it requires a lot of sacrifice. And I wanna take you back to the Women's March. A lot of people here went to the Women's March, whether you went to the Women's March in Washington, D.C., or whether you stayed home and went to women's marches and sister marches across this country. And I didn't have to be part of the women's march. Your sister got a lot of work. I got kids, I got laundry, I got organizations to run, people to pay, I don't have a lot of time. But the reason why I went to the women's march is based on the quote from Charlie Shism. She said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. Sister Linda bought a few folding chairs because I was not about to allow there to be a historic moment like the Women's March without the voices and visibility of Muslim American women across this country. But your sister Linda doesn't like to just sit on the chair. I don't want to just be a person that sits on the folding chair. I want to be on the top of the table. Our agenda as a Muslim community and as Muslim women needs to be at the center of the table. Why? Because the issues that impact us as Muslim women, as women of color, ain't the same issues that impact white women. So the white women could have had their own march and it would have been great and they would have wore their pink hats and it would have been all fine. But we would not have been seen, we would not have been heard. They would have talked about reproductive rights and equal pay. No, nobody would have talked about racial justice and economic justice. Nobody would have talked about health care or religious freedom if we as Muslim women and women of color were not at that table. So it's not about just bringing your chair to the table. It's about bringing your voice and imposing your values and principles on the tables that you are ready to sit out. This also reminds me, this quote reminds me of the 2016 elections. I didn't have to be a national surrogate for Bernie Sanders, but you know what? I love me some Bernie Sanders. In fact, Bernie Sanders, just for the record, sisters and brothers, this is what Bernie Sanders said today. He said the killing of Palestinian demonstrators by Israeli forces in Gaza is tragic. It is the right of all people to protest for a better future without a violent response. That's the leader, sisters and brothers. And I was proud to be a national surrogate for Bernie Sanders. It wasn't about Bernie Sanders for me. I'm not usually inspired by old white men and definitely not old white men from Vermont. But 
Bernie Sanders was the exception. Why? Because the Bernie Sanders campaign gave us an opportunity to be holistically who we were. Nobody told me don't be too Palestinian, don't be too Muslim up there, Linda. They said you go up there and you say and do what you need to do to ensure that your community feels heard and they feel proud to participate in a national presidential campaign. In 2016, we proved in many parts of the country that we were in Allah about to have an election that's going to talk about us without us. And because of the participation and the mobilization of American Muslims across this country, but in particular in places like Michigan and Wisconsin, guess what happened? It was the Muslims in Michigan that gave Bernie Sanders the biggest political upset in U.S. history. It was the participation of Muslims in Wisconsin that gave Bernie Sanders another win that he wasn't supposed to have. So when we organize, sisters and brothers, when we show up, when we participate, we have a lot of power and a lot of influence. So let me take you now to the 2018 elections. And this is where the hard truths come in. So in 2016, the Muslim community participated in the primaries. <clears throat> the bottom line is you didn't participate in the general election. And I know that because I watched the statistics. I got the numbers, sisters and brothers, and the numbers don't lie. And I understand, and I tried to sit with myself and say, I know we didn't want to vote for a candidate that voted for war against our beloved sisters and brothers in Iraq. I get it. We didn't want to vote for a woman who was so right on the issue of Israel-Palestine. I get it. But sometimes, sisters and brothers, and I know some people won't agree with me here, but sometimes we got to participate in something to stop a little bit of the bleeding. And 2016 was our opportunity to work a little harder and to put somebody like Hillary in office, but work harder to hold her accountable. But what ended up happening is that we put in a fascist, racist, sexist, misogynist, who is in, in fact, no question about it, implementing a white supremacist agenda that is targeting the communities that we come from and that we love. So let's just all admit that a big mistake happened in 2016. So you know what people say? They say you got to learn from your mistakes. And I'm asking all of you, my Muslim sisters and brothers, that we have to win back the House and the Senate in 2018. Now listen to me here. My model of organizing is about liberation. I want all of us to be free. And I don't, in fact, believe that electoral politics is the way or the only way to liberation. What I do see about electoral politics, it is one tool in our toolbox to at least lessen the suffering just a little bit. So when I went to the polls in 2016 and cast my vote, I voted for black people. I voted for undocumented people. I voted for Muslims and refugees and immigrants and folks who are on of the most marginalized in our community. I wasn't selfish. I didn't go to the polls and say, I'm going to vote based on my own self-righteous politics. I don't vote to feel good, sisters and brothers. Voting is not about feeling good. Voting in this country is about protecting the most marginalized people that live amongst us, and if we can, stop a little bit of the bleeding and the injustice that is happening. So what I want you to do this year is I need you to register to vote. And don't assume that you are registered to vote. And if you're a New Yorker, we can tell you in New York that over 150,000 people were purged from the voter list. They said they weren't registered, or they said they weren't registered with the right party. So don't assume that you are already registered to vote. Go online, figure out if you're, vote, if you're registered, but figure it out if you're with the actual party that you want to be a part of. And then register your father and your mother and your sister and your cousin. And when somebody tells you, I don't want to engage in politics, I don't want to be political, I will remind you, my Muslim sisters and brothers, that when you woke up this morning and you were breathing and you're Muslim, you're political. 
There is no question about whether you are political or not. You live in a country that has politicized you, so it is your responsibility to act and defend our rights in these United States of America. Now, this idea about invitation. Sisters and brothers, as a Muslim American, I don't wait for people to invite me to the table. I earned my seat as a Muslim American on every table in this country. You know why? Because I understand my history in these United States of America. And when I walk the streets, when I go into organizing spaces, when I hear that somebody's doing something, I show up there. And I, not only do I, I don't really have to demand a seat, I just take the seat and I sit down. You know why? Because that seat that I sat on, somebody sacrificed for me. And I'm going to sit on that seat because my lineage as a Muslim American in this country goes back to enslaved African Muslims who sacrificed everything so you could sit in this room today and call yourself an American Muslim. We as Muslims in this country have a lineage to enslaved African people who did not choose to come here. We have a lineage to immigrants who did choose to come here to flee poverty and war and conflict. We have contributed enough to this nation. We have built this nation with the sweat and blood and tears of our people. So we don't need people to invite us to stuff. If there's a table that does not want you at it, you Muslims go build your own table because you have enough intellect and enough skills to create your own tables in these United States of America. Stop, my sisters and brothers, we gotta stop waiting for people to approve of our existence. We have to understand that we have our own self-worth, that we have given a lot to this nation. When people say America is a great nation, guess what? It is great because we are here. It is great because we made our lives here. It is great because our people built Islam in these United States of America. This is why America is a great nation. I never really understand the Muslim community. Like, I get confused sometimes. And if anybody has answers to these questions, please help enlighten me. I always wonder why Muslims sit back and are not as active as they should be. I always wonder, do Muslims think that they live in a country where rights fall from the sky? Do you think that out of nowhere, one day, boom, Muslims are going to be great, there's not going to be any Islamophobia, the members of Congress and the Senate are going to be like, mashallah, we love the Muslims, we're going to pass now and go on to another community? This is not how it works in these United States of America. Sisters and brothers, Regardless of what faith you are or what race or what ethnicity, people in this country from the days of its founding have continued to fight for their rights to be who they are, to practice the, uh, the, their religion in the way that they want to practice it. This is not something that ever, like the Catholics didn't just become, you know, quote, mainstream because they just sat around. They stood up. Jews in this country stood up for their rights. Black people have continued every single day to stand up for their rights to be black in America. Indigenous people continue to stand for their right on their own land to be fully indigenous in these United States of America. So I don't know why Muslims are the only ones that think that for some reason Allah is just going to open the sky and drop some civil rights on you. That's just not how it works. If it didn't work like that for anybody else, odds are it's not going to work for you like that. So Shirley Shizam also said this in relation to this idea uh, about how we need to be showing up. She said, you don't make progress by standing on the sidelines, whimpering and complaining. You make progress by implementing ideas. So basically what Shirley Chisholm was telling you, and I'm going to tell it to you in the Brooklyn way, because by the way, Shirley Chisholm was from Brooklyn. I don't know if you all knew that. Letting you know. Sisters and brothers, stop complaining. I don't want to hear another Muslim telling me, Sister Linda, look how bad this is, and this member of Congress said something anti-Muslim, and these people are anti-Palestinian, and I don't know. What are you doing about it? Stop complaining to me about all the bad things unless you're also going to tell me what your solution to the problem is. In this country, sisters and brothers, there's two things about, that I will say about this democracy. 
Inshallah, one day we will come to a point where we have a full, inclusive democracy in America. But for now, this is what democracy looks like. Votes and money. So if the Muslim community is not ready to put their money where their mouth is, and if you're not ready to stand up and use your right to vote in this country. And let me talk about voting for just a second. A lot of us, our parents or grandparents came from countries where they don't have a right to vote. In fact, we have a lot of Muslims who are standing up against snipers for the very right to participate in a democracy. Now, the democracies, for the, for the very little that we have in the Middle East and in the Muslim world, they don't always work well, just like democracy doesn't always work well here in the United States. But the fact that our Muslim brothers and sisters are fighting for their right to vote in democracy and we're just sitting back, the fact that we have black people in this country who literally died, sisters and brothers, people lost their lives for you to have the right to vote in these United States of America. Honor the sacrifices and the blood and the torture that people endured so that you can be able to participate in democracy. So, when I talk about being invited to tables, I already told you I'm not looking for an invitation. I just show up. Now, there are other types of tables where I'm confused why I have to invite Muslims to. Why do I have to invite American Muslims to a table to organize against police brutality? Why do I have to invite you to a table to organize on behalf of undocumented people who are literally in fear of being separated from their families? Why do I have to invite the Muslims to fight for health care? Why do I have to invite the Muslims to fight for a living wage? I never understood, sisters and brothers, why many of us organizers and activists and leaders of organizations, we show up to organizing spaces and I look around the room and I see like one Muslim and two Muslims. What does that say about us when we are not showing up at the tables fighting for rights and fighting for justice and fighting for equality? What kind of message do you send about our deen when for many people in the Muslim community, let me say this, because I've heard a lot of people talk about this, alhamdulillah, at this conference. When Stefan Clark was shot, actually, I'm going to rephrase that. He was massacred by the Sacramento Police Department. And you know me already, I'm already in this. I'm not ever surprised when a black man or woman are killed at the hands of law enforcement. But I am outraged every single time, and I don't give a damn if Stephen Clark was black or Muslim or not Muslim. It didn't matter to me, sisters and brothers that he was a Muslim. Because Stephon Clark and Eric Garner and Oscar Grant and Ayanna Stanley Jones and Rakia Boyd and Trayvon Martin and Ramali Graham, and I can sit here for days and name unarmed black man and woman killed at the hands of law enforcement in their country. First and foremost, they are part of your human family. Second of all, they're part of your American family. And it is outrageous that there isn't a groundswell of Muslims out in these streets saying, stop killing black people. It is outrageous that there isn't a groundswell of Muslims saying that undocumented people and refugees deserve to live with dignity and respect in these United States of America. Sisters and brothers, we got a lot of work to do. I need you to work with me. There have been many activists and organizers on the front lines. I'm not afraid. I am grateful to Allah every single day that he even gave me the skills and the courage and the voice to do the work that I do. I'm not afraid of opposition. I don't care what people think about the Muslims. We don't live for other people. We live for God. And all of us have something in common. We're all going to die. You are all going to face your Lord and he's going to ask you, 
Where were you when young, unarmed black men and women were being killed on the streets of your communities? Where were you when children were separated from their families by an unjust deportation system and an unjust draconian immigration law system in these United States? Where were you when they were stripping your fellow Americans, including Muslims, of health care, where people were literally dying on your watch? What are you going to say, sisters and brothers? What is going to be your response when God asked you, did you try? Did you let your voice be heard? Did you show up for a mother who lost her child to police violence? Where were you when injustice was happening around you? I pray to Allah that I have many answers to those questions. And I ask you to reflect what your answers are going to be when you are asked where you are when these injustices continue to happen, not only here in the United States of America, but abroad, like we're watching our Palestinian sisters and brothers who are bravely and courageously standing up for their right to protest and demonstrate on their land, on Palestinian land. So I'm gonna end by telling you a few things that I want you to do. Number one, you're going to go home and register to vote and make sure you're registered to vote. And then you're going to actually vote because there's a difference between registering to vote and then not going to the polls on election day. I want you to participate in primaries and in the general election. Then our sisters and brothers at USCMO, which is a coalition of organizations that include ICNA, MASS, CARE, MANA, MUNA, and I can go on. They're having a Muslim Lobby Day, May 7th and May 8th, in Washington, D.C. Last year, they had 500 people. There should really be 5,000, in my opinion. I don't know why we only had 500 people. Members of Congress have to see us. They have to hear us. And they have to understand that we, too, have priorities and we, too, have an agenda as an American Muslim community. I also want you to join me and Imam Omar and Imam Griggs and many other sisters and brothers and Brother Mikhail Stewart and others tomorrow, 12 p.m., McPherson Square, which is literally just a few streets away from here, to stand up boldly and proudly to demand justice for Stefan Clark and his family, to stand up as Muslims and say, black lives matter and always mattered in the beautiful faith that we follow. And that we as a Muslim community believe wholeheartedly in the sanctity of life. And we believe that Stefan Clark, just like every other black man and woman in our country, deserves to roam the streets of their communities and deserves to live safely in their homes, in their backyards, in their works, on their college campuses without fear of being shot by the people who are supposed to protect and serve us. So I hope that you join me there tomorrow at 12 p.m. I ask Allah to guide our community. I ask Allah to instill in us the moral courage that we need at this moment to defend our families, our children, our institutions, and our beautiful deen. I ask God to protect our beautiful children, to give them the pride and the opportunity to understand how important it is for them to be unapologetically Muslim in these United States of America. I want you to leave here, sisters and brothers, understanding that we have nothing to be apologetic about. We have nothing to apologize for as Muslim Americans. In fact, we have everything to be proud of, and this nation will come to terms with us and who we are, and one day they will be proud of the American Muslim community because we are, in fact, the moral conscious of these United States of America. Assalamu alaikum and thank you, Ikna.